Did any of you ever have an imaginary friend when you were younger? A friend that you saw every day and nobody else could see them. You could swear up and down that they were 100% real to you, but nobody else could see the imaginary friend. It's normal for children to have a crazy imagination. They grow out of it, right? Usually, whenever we're growing up, we draw a line between reality and imagination. But sometimes it's not your typical imaginary friend. Sometimes it's much deeper than that. The brain is a crazy thing. It controls how you think and how you perceive the world. Today I want to tell you about a mental disorder called schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is a mental disorder in which people interpret, they interpret their reality differently than normal. It causes hallucinations, delusions, and unorganized mental processing. Although there is no definite cause for schizophrenia, genetics, environment, and unbalanced brain chemistry seem to play a major role in developing this disorder. There are five different types of schizophrenia. Paranoid schizophrenia, disorganized schizophrenia, catatonic schizophrenia, residual schizophrenia, and undifferentiated schizophrenia. They all have different symptoms that come along with it, and they all have debilitating symptoms that can affect your daily life. Making meals, just communicating with people, brushing your teeth, just typical hygiene things people with schizophrenia can have trouble with. Treatment definitely differs from case to case. And with treatment, some people can have a successful life. It's important for us to know exactly what the symptoms are of schizophrenia so we can determine if someone we know suffers from the illness itself. You may be one of 70 million people living with a disorder. Anyone can develop schizophrenia. It doesn't, it doesn't, It, it affects men and women equally in all ethnic groups. Teens can also develop the illness, and in some rare occasions, children as well. Teens can get schizophrenia, but it may be used, it may be hard to see at first. This is because the symptoms look like typical normal teenage behavior. Getting bad grades in school, outbursts of anger, sometimes it looks normal. Maybe they'll grow out of it, maybe they won't. It's important for people our age to know the symptoms so that we can, we can help somebody if someone you know has it. So if you or some, anyone you know have these symptoms, it's important to seek professional help immediately so you do not become a harm to yourself or others. <coughs> the first cause of schizophrenia are genes. Now, genes are what encode um, everything that is about you. Every, anything that uh, every, it dictates how you grow uh, on a molecular structure and uh, how, how your brain develops. But uh, the thing with, with schizophrenic people is this has been identified as a brain disorder. So the first signs to look at are uh, what's going on in the brain. And what's responsible for some of these brain uh, brain development is some. Uh, they found that schizophrenic people have a larger percentage of mutations than their parents. Uh, basically, how genes are passed is two two parents' genes come together, and they are they're crossed, and you are basically a product of two people's genes and. 
they're a product of even more people's genes down your family tree. So the first sign to look at is if, you're, if you have a family history of, of schizophrenia. If, you're, if you have a parent, a mother or father who is a biological parent to you, and they're diagnosed with schizophrenia, then you have up to a 10% chance of getting it. And this is enough, a high enough percentage to be alarmed because this is a very debilitating disease. Uh, you know, people have a tough time living normal lives and often they don't even know if they're normal or they're not very self-aware. Uh, so what's, what's worse with the genes is if you share genes, which is like a twin, if you have an identical twin, then basically all of your genes are the same, but the way that they are expressed is a little differently. If you have the same genes as a twin, you're at a 50% chance of having schizophrenia if your twin was diagnosed with schizophrenia. So the, the first point to look at with uh, seeing if you have it is through your family tree. Uh, there is really few things that you can do for children to see if they have it. Uh, you know, a child doesn't come out and start, start flailing and you start thinking about the possible things that it, it has wrong. Uh, there's, there's no really physical uh, thing with schizophrenia until you're an adult and, uh, you know, kids, kids are very imaginative and, and this is why, they, um, you know, when, when kids say they have imaginary friends, you can't straight up say that uh, they have schizophrenia because you have to wait until uh, areas of like puberty where the brain is still developing because this is first and foremost a brain disorder. Now, uh, there's, there's no specific genes that we can look at and say, this is, this is the schizophrenic gene. You either have it or you don't have it. Uh, so we can't just uh, look at your genome, which is an entire collection of all the genes that make up you. Uh, which are basically a, a whole chain of uh, nucleotides. So uh, genes are just, just chains of, of molecules that uh, are billions and billions of lengths long and that, that's what contributes to, to making up whether you have brown hair, uh, whether, you know, your body type. And uh, so there's no, there's no schizophrenic gene is the important part here. And that's why schizophrenia is, is tough, to, tough to kind of point out until you're able to give someone about 20 years until you know, their brain has finally stopped developing. But it's, it's worse than this too because not everyone who has uh, this, this uh, just because your parent doesn't live with schizophrenia, just because you don't have a twin that has schizophrenia, there's, uh, there's many environmental issues that can, can go wrong here. Um, if you are already predisposed to it and you have uh, family issues, so let's say you, you believe you're completely normal, um, but uh, you ha start having uh, environmental issues such as unhealthy uh, family relationships, and you don't have a very, a very stable foundation on which to build your life from. Uh, these people are normally lost in life. They have to kind of uh, find their own route. And, and this is very difficult. And this is why it's very important to have a, a strong family. And problems with, with unhealthy uh, family issues is you can start uh, going down a really really strong paths of thinking that make you question, you know, why you're here, suicidal thoughts. Um, all of this really plays a role in all the brain chemistry that's going on because uh, all your emotions are dictated by chemicals and how your brain interprets these. So if you're living a happier life and a more stable uh, routine, then, you know, it's you're gonna have a little easier life. It's these people that grow up in unsafe conditions where it, it's tough for their brain to develop. Uh, if they're not getting fed properly, let's say you're, you're uh, living in poverty, 
and it's uh, it's tough to you know complete that whole entire food pyramid. Uh, it's important you get an uh, entire well balanced diet. Um, kids who you know may be forced to only live on on grains or rice, uh, you know they're only really getting their carbohydrates. Now the brain is composed of uh, over ninety percent fat. Uh, this is uh, what's called the gray matter. Uh, so it's important that that kids get, you know, this full this full diet because it's important for their brain development. Everything that you put in your body is digested, and that energy becomes you. You're literally the food that, that you eat. Uh, it becomes the new cells in your body. So it's important to get a, a full range of supplements, and vitamins, and minerals, because unsafe. Uh, Unsafe environmental problems can bring out these schizophrenic uh, delusions, hallucinations, behaviors. Uh, this is why it's it's not just like one in, one in ten people get schizophrenia because it can be even higher if they're living with these unsafe conditions. Uh, other problems with the environment is people who experiment with many hallucinogenic drugs. Uh, people who uh, who get to see the worlds differently just because they're altering the chemistry in their body. Uh, hallucinogens like lysergic acid diethylamide, uh, LSD with hippies, um, there is definitely a spike in schizophrenia because this isn't a very uh, old disease. Uh, this is something that, that's a little newer in terms of, of understanding uh, mental disorders uh, because uh, back in you know thousands of years ago, people weren't they didn't get the uh, the chance to sit down and just like experiment with drugs. You know they were living lives where they had to eat every day, and it's uh it's really people who are living uh, a tough life who are most uh, likely to develop schizophrenia. So uh, other problems is drugs that are given to developing kids. It's, it's more drugs that are taking when you're developing, not when your brain has already come to completely uh, stop growing, uh, stop expanding, because there's these, uh, these two parts in the brain that uh, are asymmetrical, and there are these fluid-filled parts. And what they found is when you look at this structure of the brain, it, it looks like a butterfly because its symmetrical wings are kind of fanned out. And uh, the larger this area is, um, it's called the butterfly area, the larger this area uh, it has been linked to uh, <coughs> higher um, diagnosis of schizophrenia. So it's um, people who have like halted brain development who are most, most likely to develop it. Other problems is uh, some of the neurotransmitters. Neurotransmitters are chemicals that are responsible for, for firing your neurons. Um, this is the fastest signaling in the body with your neurons because it literally travels at the speed of light because uh, neurons travel by uh, electricity. What they found is the, the two most common uh, neurotransmitters to look at for schizophrenia are dopamine and glutamate. Uh, so, Glutamate is, is one of the neurotransmitters. You, everyone's most, uh, most come across thing with glutamate are things like monosodium glutamate, MSG, found in a lot of food. Uh, this is easily known for enhancing food, food flavors. So this is literally tricking your brain, your brain's chemistry into believing that food is, is uh, tasting better than it really is. It's, it's things like these neurotransmitters that when, they, when they're not at normal, uh, balanced uh, rates, that your brain starts, it, it brain starts trying to fix itself. And sometimes the stress of trying to fix itself can bring out these delusions, hallucinations that come out with schizophrenia. Uh, there's no link between um, any of, whether it's just like brain chemistry causes one type of schizophrenia, uh, it's not like low glutamate causes paranoid schizophrenia. It's not low dopamine causes catatonic schizophrenia. 
And, and that's why this is a very interesting subject, is there's no, there's no definite causes yet. There's only links and uh, some, some correlations that don't necessarily point to causation. So uh, when, when you're malnourished and you, uh, you don't get that right amount of, of fat in your diet, you don't get that right amount of just, you need, you need a well-balanced life, you need a strong, uh, strong family. And that's why what we'll see later is with some of the treatments, we try to, we try to balance these, uh, these neurotransmitters. We try to keep a stronger family. It's important to educate uh, your family on what's going on. It's important to, to educate uh, the patient with what is happening because a lot of these people are, are so deep into their mental disorder that they're really unsure of who they are. So it's important to uh, educate some of these people. But uh, again, there's, there's really no direct, this treatment causes this type of schizophrenia. And we'll, we'll see that when we start talking about the different types right now. Okay, the first type of schizophrenia I would like to talk about is paranoid schizophrenia. Paranoid schizophrenia is the main subtype of schizophrenia that the majority of people end up being diagnosed with. Um, paranoid schizophrenia um, consists of hallucinations, delusions, um, false belief that uh, people are trying to come after them or members of their family. Paranoid schizophrenia usually consists of something called delusions of grandeur as well. Delusions of grandeur is when somebody has a false belief of feeling more important than others than, than they really are. Um, they usually feel like they are on a mission or they need to accomplish some sort of mission. And usually to other people it's it's not true. Um, paranoid schizophrenia is something that I have been able to come in contact with. Um, when I was younger, I met a man who was paranoid schizophrenic. He was your average 50-year-old man that you would think, except whenever he would start coming up with stories and then you start questioning the stories. He convinced my family one time that he had a job. He got up and got ready for work in the morning and got dropped off at his job and we'd think that he would go in and work and he'd get off at the same day and come home and talk about work like oh, even talk about things that happened at work, uh, how he had a long day. Um, he, we never really caught on until one day we decided to go by his job and see if he was there. And they had no idea who it was. Who, who They had no employee of that name. Um, it was, it, we were very taken back by it. It, it surprised us and then um, we remember that he's paranoid schizophrenic. I mean, that's another symptom that comes along with it. We just didn't know how serious it was. Uh, he would talk about things all the time that just didn't, it wasn't right. After that, um, we started calling on it more and seeing that he wasn't really telling the truth. And some of the other stories consisted of how he would walk downtown and one day a TV got thrown from a top story window from an apartment and it landed on this lady that was walking in front of him and the TV just barely missed him and you know we that never happened because well you'd think that it would be on the news wouldn't you it was it it was very different but the thing is with paranoid schizophrenia is that this is the type of schizophrenia where people more than likely with treatment will go on to live a successful and happy life. Um, it is okay to um, 
have some of the hallucinations and delusions that you might have, but with medication and proper treatment, you know, um, these people can, can be normal. Um, the, the memory and concentration and uh, dulled emotions aren't, aren't really affected as much as the other types in, with paranoid schizophrenia. Like I said, this is the most common subtype for people to be diagnosed with. The next, the next type I, I would like to talk to you about is a more, it's a more serious case of paranoid, or sorry, it's a more, it's a more serious case of schizophrenia. This would be disorganized schizophrenia. Now, disorganized schizophrenia is much more complicated. It consists of incoherent and illogical thoughts and behaviors. They usually have poor speech, lack of spontaneous movement, and usually blunted emotion. These people usually laugh for no reason. Um, you might find them maybe snickering or laughing at a funeral, some place where there's a more solemn occasion. Um, people with disorganized schizophrenia usually vary with their emotions. They can go from being very childlike and silly to, in a snap, very angry and violent. Um, usually it, it, it's their delusions and their hallucinations that they have as well that trigger this kind of emotional um, breakdown. These people have more of a hard time doing daily activities, waking up in the morning and brushing your teeth, brushing your hair, putting deodorant on, washing your face. These people usually have bad hygiene. If you were to see somebody with disorganized schizophrenia, they probably would look like a bum on the streets. That's usually what they look like. People with disorganized schizophrenia um, usually need to be institutionalized uh, so they can be taken care of. Um, medical treatment is usually initiated by a family member. Um, people with disorganized schizophrenia don't really understand that they know that they have a problem. People with disorganized schizophrenia also might be dressing in more layers of clothing on a hot day and wear very little clothing on a cold day. So that's another thing that um, is it's difficult for them. The next type would be catatonic schizophrenia. And this one is very, very complicated and I'd like for you guys to actually take a look and pay attention to how this is different from all the other types that we've talked about. Catatonia. Catatonia is a state of increased muscle tone and rest, which is abolished by voluntary activities and therefore distinguished from extracranial side effects. In these clips, you'll see a variety of forms of catatonia demonstrated by role player being examined by a psychiatrist. This clip shows force grasping, where a patient is unable to comply with instructions to resist a preferred handshake. Characteristically, the interviewer has difficulty getting his hand away. Move your arms around a little bit. Is that okay? Okay. 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 What I'm going to do, I'm going to put my hand out, but I don't want you to shake it. Okay, okay here you go. Think carefully about what I'm asking you to do. When I put my hand out, as though I'm going to shake your hand, don't take it, I do not want you to shake my hand. Is time. Okay. Okay, that's fine. 
and relax for a second. In this clip, waxy flexibility is demonstrated when a patient's limbs are placed in an unusual position. We're going to remain for a sustained period. I'm just going to move your arms down for me. Shake my hand, Peter. Okay, we'll leave that for now. Now, with catatonic schizophrenia, um, usually they can be um, mixed up with something called tardive dyskinesia. Tardive dyskinesia is assuming unusual body positions or manifests unusual contortions or limb, limb movements. Um, it, it mimics the same behavior. Um, diagnosis of catatonic schizophrenia usually stays um, provisional until adequate diagnosis is obtained. They have to find evidence um, of catatonic schizophrenia until they can actually diagnose this usually. It takes a uh, longer time to diagnose this. The next type I would like to talk about is undifferentiated schizophrenia. This is more of a piece of each type. Um, it does not fit in one subtype. It has a mixture of all of them. Usually this would be mixed up with something called mixed clinical syndrome, meaning mixed emotions um, in a mix of symptoms. It's, it's everything all in one, really. Uh, so someone with undifferentiated schizophrenia might have illogical thought process and behaviors as well as the delusions and hallucinations, as well as maintaining, maybe uh, maintaining um, weird limb positions. The last and final uh, type of schizophrenia I'd like to talk, talk about is residual schizophrenia. Residual schizophrenia is usually diagnosed um, come after being paranoid schizophrenic or catatonic schizophrenic or disorganized schizophrenic. Um, these people have their symptoms kind of uh, and even kill. Um, some of the sy symptoms still are there. You can still see some of the symptoms with the hallucinations and delusions, but they're not as bad as they were in the beginning. Um, these people usually um, go through treatment for a long time and have medication, and these people usually can live a normal life as well. Um, it's important for these people to continue with therapy and medication and choose a healthy environment to live in after being diagnosed with residual schizophrenia because 
the symptoms can come back um, and it can get worse. Usually um, residual schizophrenia, you have times of having barely any symptoms at all, to being worse, to having none. The symptoms really fluctuate. Um, so you can see here that there are pretty much three main types. You have catatonic, paranoid, schizophrenic, and as well as disorganized. You have undifferentiated, which is a mixture of all, and residual, which is diagnosed after another more severe case of schizophrenia. So the first option, once we find that someone is diagnosed with any of these five types, is to resort to uh, drugs. The sort of drugs that we use are antipsychotics. Uh, these drugs greatly affect the brain chemistry of people. Uh, some of these drugs try to balance the neurotransmitters of dopamine and glutamate, uh, but these drugs are very harsh on, on anyone taking them because it completely changes the, the wiring of your brain. Uh, we're, we're trying to sometimes uh, you know, balance out the peaks of high brain activity. We're trying to, to bring that down. Sometimes uh, there's too little brain activity and you have to bring it up. So there's, there's two large generations of drugs. The first uh, part of the, the first generation of these drugs, we're just trying to uh, get rid of the hallucinations and delusions. But uh, the second generation of these drugs, which are the newer drugs, uh, try, to, try to balance out the positive symptoms and the negative symptoms of schizophrenia. Because uh, some of the positive symptoms of schizophrenia actually are you know, higher, higher creativity, more imagination. These people can think outside the box. They can, they can really uh, apply new ideas to things when, when they can actually think and function. But, you know, schizophrenia often, you know, with the, with the catatonic people, they can't, they can't move very well. Sometimes they can't talk. Uh, the disorganized people, they can, they don't, their, their brain basically speaks for them. They don't have like a, a thought process behind what they're going to say next. Uh, their brain just kind of keeps going. Uh, it's important that we don't only just give these patients drugs. Uh, it's important that they also attend therapy and they, uh, they're educated and uh, they, they get that, that strong family that they, that they need to actually go out and live a normal life. 75% uh, of all schizophrenics uh, discontinue drugs on their own. Uh, that's why it's, it's tough for them to live to live on their own, normally they need that family to, to remind them, hey, did you, did you take your medication today? Uh, they go to support groups, um, you know, so everyone, they're always, they're surrounded by, by people who are trying to get better, but uh, most of the time, it, the schizophrenics don't admit themselves to, to hospitals, they don't, they don't go seeking help, it, it's normally, you know, it, it's obvious with people like, like the catatonic schizophrenics, where uh, you know you run into these people and they are not normal whatsoever. So someone would actually have to, to bring them in. But uh, that's why it's important that they also get the, the therapy that they need behind these drugs. But uh, the, the drugs are again not not an easy fix. You know, there's more than 20 of these brain altering drugs, and often they're not ever going to work for you. You have to keep finding testing new ones and and that's what's really tough with the brain is it's always trying to fix itself and when we start giving it uh, external stimuli uh, it's going to want to revert back to how it was and with just drugs alone there's a very high relapse rate because many of these people stop taking their drugs they think that they're going to be fine and to be honest that they're not they need to they need to continue what they're doing and stop drastically changing their life uh, the, the next thing is psychotherapy. This is just educating uh, the schizophrenics of what's, what's going on. Tell them that you know, it's, not, it's not their fault that they think that they're, they're crazy or uh, you know, people look at them weird or they, they think they see, they see eyes like the paranoids. They think everyone's watching them. Uh, it's important that we tell them that this is, you know, this is normal, that other people like you you're not you're not the only person having to live with this because it, it affects one percent of the population, which 
it's a large amount when, when we have 7 billion people on the earth. You know, that's, that's 70 million people uh, potentially at risk. I mean, it's, a, it's important that we don't just uh, push these people off as crazy and let them do their own thing. Uh, these, these people need help or sometimes they will throw, um, throw tantrums and destroy things and uh, you know, a lot of people like this are not healthy to be around and it, it's kind of a shame that they have to live in asylums and uh, they have to live within their own people but uh, it's the only way that they're going to continue to get the help that they need. So uh, the last one is definitely the most bizarre of the treatments and the most controversial of all of them. Uh, these people are put under general anesthesia and their brain is shocked. It's called electroconvulsive therapy. Uh, basically they administer brief seizures to these people to try to rewire their brains and while they're under anesthesia it keeps their body uh, not moving so you don't see the whole the whole thrusting of the entire body, normally only their hands shake. Uh, this is by no means a quick fix. It's very effective, but it, none of these things are good alone. Um, normally this is uh, considered a last option because it is a little bizarre to go under anesthesia and have someone shock your brain, but uh, if, these, I mean these people are desperate sometimes. Sometimes they take so many meds that it makes them, makes them worse. Uh, some people don't go to therapy, they stop using drugs. Uh, this is normally just a, a last resort. But uh, yeah, again, this without being coupled with therapy and, and medication is about as ineffective as the rest. It's important that you get, you get multiple sides of, uh, of medication, therapy, and uh, basically, uh, there's really no cause of schizophrenia except for altered brain uh, patterns. And sometimes uh, children, it's hardly, uh, it's really difficult to see because their brain isn't even fully developed. So it's something that's more commonly seen when you're older. And it's tough because there's not one telltale sign of schizophrenia. You know, there's, there's these five different types, and and with the residuals, these people, you know, you come in contact with them, they could seem absolutely normal. Uh, the catatonic is definitely a more uh, more physical looking problem. You can easily see that one. It's not until people start uh, telling you all these crazy stories that you start questioning them. But it's important we don't just push these people off. It's important we bring them to, uh, to help uh, to find the right medication for them. It's important that they have support in their lives. And uh, thank you. Thank you.